Dear guests, we proceed with session two, which sheds light on the human organs 3D printing and genetic editing. So are we set for a disabilities-free future? Our panelists will answer that question. هذه الجلسة يديرها الدكتور علي النقبي أستاذ مشارك بجامعة الإمارات فليتفضل إلى المنصة. This session is moderated by Ali Naqbi, the associate professor of UAE University. Please welcome on stage. صباح الخير. Good morning, everyone. The session today will be in English and. We'll be talking about the 3D printing. We'll be <coughs> My name is Ali Hilal Naqbi, Associate Professor at UAE University Bioengineering, and I am the Director of Abu Dhabi Polytechnic in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Last week, we had um, a future council meetings in the World Economic Forum, and we had a very nice discussion about different councils and the futures of a humanity. And I am a member of a future council of a human enhancement. We talk for two days. But what is interestingly that we did a survey in the United States for more than 2,000 people, and we asked them basic questions. And one of the questions that we asked them, do you know what does a human enhancement mean? Only 10% of the total population know what is a human enhancement is. Do you want to be enhanced? Do you want to have a super limb that lifts a few kilograms? Or the capability of you will be enhanced? All of them say, no, 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 we don't want. But if you change the question to have a vision of microscopic level, everyone would love to have or to be enhanced. Today we have a very interesting topic that we will be talking about, and specifically 3D printing and bioprinting. Without any further ado, I will call my panelists, who are some of them a friend of mine, who were at Harvard when I was there one day in 2009. The first member of today, or the speaker, will be Dr. Philip Kennedy, who obtained his MD degrees in Ireland in 1972, followed by his PhD at Northern Western University in Chicago in 1983. And he then went to Georgia Tech before founding his company, Neural Signal NSI. Working in collaboration with Dr. Kennedy, had himself implanted in 2014 with a view of detecting patterns firing in the head in order to unlock the key to the patterns of firing of single in neurons during speech. Please. Join me to welcome Dr. Philip Kennedy. Our second speaker is Dr. Atala, Anthony Atala, the director of Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine and a practicing surgeon and regenerative medicine researcher. His work focuses on growing human tissues and organ using cells and 3D printing. His work has been listed twice as Times Magazine's top 10 medical breakthrough of the year. He has received numerous awards, including Edison Award and Research and Development 2016 Innovator of the Year Award. He published more than 600 publications and he edited more than 20 books. Please join me to welcome Anthony Phillips. Our third speaker is John Nosta, who was at Harvard in 1980s. And he's a thinker and entrepreneur in the world of science, medicine, and innovation. John is a founder of Nosta Lab, a digital health think tank. 
He is currently regarded as the one of the top global strategic and creative thinkers in digital health. Please join me to welcome John. The fourth speaker for today's interesting topic is Shafi Ahmed. He's a professor in cancer and he's a surgeon at the Royal London Hospital as a dedicated trainer, educator, and associate dean at Bartos Medical School. He was awarded the Silver Scalps Award in 2015 at the Best National Trainer in Surgery by the Association of the Surgeons in the Training. In 2017, he was the top of British Asian star and tech received his, because of this, he received this award by the Duke of York. Please join me to welcome Dr. Shafi Ahmed. Our fifth speaker today will be Raymond. Raymond is a scientist, engineer, and entrepreneur. Working in the forefront of biotechnology, Raymond explores how applying technology of life. Biotechnology, genetics, medicine, agriculture is affecting every one of us. Raymond is a chair of the biotech track at Singularity University at Silicon Valley Think Tank. And he is a co-founder and chief architect for BioCurious. He or his work and the story has been featured in Forbes, Times, and Nature magazines. Please join me to welcome Raymond. Thank you. The videos. Hi, everyone. Okay, this is how we go. Um, there are certain questions that I have, and I will go one by one. So I will start with you, or I. Maybe this is a question for everyone. Sure. Now, about the three, about the four, um, fourth um, industrial revolution and um, the, the 3D. Everyone now is talking about 3D printing, and everyone now is saying that we are away from the fourth industrial revolution. But most of the people that I have met last week in the World Economic Forum meetings, they are saying we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. Now they are talking about the 3D printing as part of this. What do you think? Let's start with you. First, I'd like to thank um, Rashid al makoum for inviting me here and for the committee, uh, the Summit Knowledge Committee inviting me. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> 3D printing as regards BCI is really not that relevant. Maybe for making some of the devices that might be implanted or used, it would be. Otherwise, I see no need. So I'm going to hand the answer over to some other people. <laughs> How about you, Atala? So, of course, you know, 3D pr uh, printing has uh, really made major advances in the field, in this, uh, certainly in the last decade. And it's going to be a critical uh, factor for advanced manufacturing. You know, a lot of the things that, are, that used to take months to create just as a prototype can now be created in just minutes. And so it's not just for prototyping anymore. Now, you know, much more, much more sophisticated printers are being developed who can print very, that can print actually very fast and very effectively. So it's going to be a, a great tool, I think, for the future. That's right. John? You know, I want to be a little more philosophical Please. About, about where we are with 3D printing and the distribution of innovation, because we often look at an innovation as, as a specific point in time, and I think that, uh, that we have an uneven distribution of 3D printing. But what I find very interesting, and I think Raymond can talk about this a little bit also, is the fact that we're seeing children do 3D printing, and we're seeing scientists and physicians and corporations do 3D printing. And to me, that's one of the few technologies that have such rich and broad appeal across so many different aspects of community. When your children can play with a 3D printer, yet we can build a house or a building or, a, or an organ with 3D printing, I think that's a testament to its place in society and where potentially it's going. 
Yeah, I'd like to go back to your first part of the question about the fourth industrial revolution actually in context. Yes. Because I think that's important to put in context. So I, I'm a physician, I'm a surgeon, and do you know something? I've been around for about two decades, uh, working in practice, and this is the most exciting time to be in medicine ever for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. It's the convergence of technologies that are happening today. So it's not the future, we're living today. Things like robotics, art intelligence, uh, nanobiotechnology, genetic editing, AR, VR, and 3D printing, all coming together at the same time to change the way we practice medicine. So actually, we're embracing change. We are here at the moment. And 3D printing is just one parcel of the future that I think is going to be pretty amazing. I think if I can just, I'm going to jump in, Shafi, because I think he hit the nail on the head with that, that we often talk about this change, the, this fourth industrial revolution, as an inflection point in human history, sometimes like a Gutenberg moment, mm -hmm. the printing press. But I think, to, to Shafi's point, it's not just a point. It's not just a printing press. We're seeing the convergence of multiple areas of development, not only technological, but social and political changes. Looking at our aging population and a critical need to manage diabetes and to manage hypertension. So social need is compounded by multiple factors of innovation, and that's what comes together and makes, makes today Mm -hmm. so important and makes this conference so relevant to the changes that are happening you know, here in Dubai and around the world. That's right, John. This is why we are going to, uh, one of the questions that here I have the longevity because of the 3D printing and the human enhancement beyond the 70 years and 90 years and 100 years and what the, what the society impact on that. But we will come to that. Yes. So, Raymond, can we? Sure, to kind of be the anchor person, I agree with everything that everybody else said and I think you know, these new technologies, 3D printing, bioprinting, gene editing, regenerative medicine, some of the advanced cellular technologies, not only are we at this really interesting takeoff point, they're really being applied now, but I tell people for biotechnology in general, we're kind of at the place where computers were in 1972. And it's starting to become not something that just large institutions do, but it's very personal. And I think some of the biggest advances are now because the enabling technologies are getting exponentially cheaper. You don't have to be a government or a corporation or a, a big research university to do this. People are doing it in their garages. And we're about to see a, a revolution there that includes some of these jobs like manufacturing jobs going away. And that means for every one of us, what are our professions going forward? How do we educate our children? And these are the, the pieces that I really spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, that's right. It is, it is actually it is two sides or two different opinions on that. People are saying it will um, cancel some jobs, and some people are saying it will create jobs. But all what we need is creating the skills for those jobs that is being created because of the fourth industrial revolution. Anthony. Everyone now is kind of 3D printing, and they would love to have their own mini 3D printing at homes for different purposes and different uh, protection lines, for example. How this technology works, uh, mainly if in, the, in the bio field, if you, if you, if you, if you feel. In the, bi in the biological field? Yeah, yeah, in biological or in general. How, how it works. Sure. So basically, you know, the printer is, is uh, there's various types of printers, of course, right? So there are many technologies out there. And really, printing started out uh, more like your typical desktop inkjet printer, right? But instead of using uh, ink, you're using other materials. And you're depositing uh, your inkjet cartridge, for example, is going in one layer at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you're printing paper, really. Mm -hmm. But the only difference is that you're printing over and over again in the same area. So uh, what, that's why it's called additive uh, printing. And so what happens is instead of actually just having a sheet of paper that goes through at one time, you're printing over and over and over again in the same area. And if we take it to a biological aspect, of course, that would be very different, right? We, we're talking about uh, printing cells or molecules or proteins, and that is actually a little bit more complex. I don't know how much you want to get into that, but... Uh, but we can right. certainly talk about that as well. I think that's fair enough for the audience to understand. Now, talking about the 3D printing, Philip, we're going to create implantable organs or mini organs that 
could be implanted within, within our body to do different functions. Uh, we know that, for example, liver organs is a very complex, and we know that kidney organ can be replaced very easily. It's different function for different organs. I know that you have implanted yourself with something. So how do you feel, how do you, how do you feel with that? How, 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 or, or maybe, maybe why you implanted yourself with something? Okay, I've got a short answer and a long answer. Is, is the long short. answer. <laughs> um, I'd been doing research on brain-computer interfacing for, oh gosh, first implant was 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say how long ago that was. I implanted somebody, the first patient we did for speech restoration was in 2004. And the issue was that he had a brainstem stroke, which is very extensive. He couldn't move, he couldn't speak, he could hardly move his eyes. So we never really knew when we asked him to say something, um, if he really was doing it. So the issue was, I've got to get somebody who can speak, maybe an ALS patient, who then will lose his speech. I couldn't find anybody who said, well, the next best person is myself. So I said, I knew the risks, okay? And I had some complications, but I knew it was worthwhile. And it has worked out fine. Um, I've got a tremendous amount of data in a short several weeks of recording, and I've analyzed it, and I feel confident now that we can actually take subjects who cannot speak uh, for various reasons that must have an intact cortex, you know, the part of the brain that controls speech. We can implant that now. I feel confident we can implant it and restore their speech. This is, this is very interesting about the B BCI. I, I read an article a few, a few, weeks, a few weeks in Nature. Um, it was a review article about the brain-computer interface and how the, um, or how this mini device can um, interact with the neural signals and convert it into something readable. How, how, how this happens, or? Uh, how do you do the decoding? I, yeah, or well, the BCI it, it itself. Right, a lot of, I actually have some videos on that if you want to show the videos, but the, um, a lot of the decoding is from either implanted or on the surface of the brain, or even EEG, mm -hmm. which is, you know, outside and a very poor resolution signal. But they have been able to, um, can you turn on one of the videos? Or maybe I should turn it on. But they've been able to control paralyzed limbs, mm -hmm. control robotic arms mm -hmm. that then help the patient. Um, I don't really want to, no, I, can, okay, just put on one of the videos to give an example. So control paralyzed limbs, robotic arms, um, and, um, and then speech. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been able to decode it pretty well. Mm. And I've used um, many of the decoding, including uh, uh, you know, neural net computers mm -hmm. from MATLAB to actually do some of the analysis. Okay. And so it's worked out pretty well, and I think it will be possible to... Uh, okay. Uh, the video, is it there? So they can't hear me? Okay, sorry. Okay. So, uh, oh, okay, that's better. So what I was saying is that uh, we have been able to decode the signals, whether it's from the surface of the brain, deep within the brain, or from the, the surface of the scalp. And, and like I said, I feel confident from my own data that we should be able to restore speech to people who are paralyzed. Right. Okay. So do you, do you, do you, do you advise people to implant the, an organ, a 3D printed, into their bodies? A 3D printed organ? Uh, well, we just implant something simpler. Similar to electrodes and electronics. Right. Um, for other aspects of implantation, other, uh, like you said, different organs would be 3D printed. Uh, as regards the nervous system, I don't see the future there. I don't, just to be quite honest with you. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah, John? But, you know, when you think about it, I mean, in terms of neural implants, it sounds very science fiction. 
you know, I'm sure many people, it's not at all, it's, it's extraordinarily clinically validated. Look at deep brain stimulation for, for Parkinson's disease. Probably the best example of really the life transforming neural interface is the cochlear implant that was profound and now is not experimental but a standard of care. And to me, that's very exciting. The other thing is being connected to the computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it sounds mysterious, but I would argue that I am already connected to my computer. I go nowhere without my smartphone, and if I don't have it, I start to get nervous. Mm -hmm. So I think that the connection is already there. We're just going to make it a little bit more uh, okay. electronic, if you will. Right. Yeah, we've already enhanced our brains because the cell phones can allow us to access enormous amounts of knowledge. And if we can make sense of that, which I guess we can, uh, by limiting how much information we bring down. Um, but also, um, I think on the screen there is that uh, Ray Kurzweil has predicted. Yeah. Uh, it actually said 2049, now he's revised it to 2029, that the uh, artificial intelligence robots will be granted citizenship. One has already been granted. Um, she's right behind us. Yeah. Right. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, I mean, some people are frightened by that concept. I just think it's the evolution of humanity, quite honestly. I, it's going to happen. If you don't like it, well, it's going to happen. Yeah. And um, the, so the, making the connection from the brain to machines is obviously important that it's done right. And I, on my little slide there, I had that um, Elon Musk is funding Neuralace. Exactly. But, you know, it's, it'll be fine. I, I know some of the data from that is pretty good. But long term wise, it won't work because scarring will grow between their electrode and the brain. And that scarring will diminish the signal and it will be useless. So long term, and it's the same with the other electrodes, the pin type electrodes. They're the same. There's always scarring, there's movement, and the signal fades out in but, a few years. They've got some mentions. But won't we about. develop nanomediated technology to d eliminate the scar no. and to optimize the implant? Or is that just too science fiction? No, they, no, they won't eliminate the scar. They have techniques of minimizing the scar, and that's been done. But it, they won't, unless you eliminate biology, you won't eliminate the scar. Right. Now, the electrode I use is different, and it's lasted for 10. Sorry to go on no, so much. It's okay. It's, it's lasted for over 10 years in a, in a patient ER who's on the internet. And the reason it's different is because we grow the brain into the electrode. We don't put the electrode in the brain. We put it in, but it grows into it. And once it grows in, it's held there. Mm -hmm. There's no scarring. They're just myelinated axons. There are a couple of gold wires across it to record from. It's very simple. And I put in as many as seven wires. And so you just record across these axons. They stay there, and they stay for over 10 years. Okay. Can, so I, let's can I just come back to sorry. that very yeah. quickly? Very quickly. The question you asked was about organ transplantation, right, initially, about organs being put in, right? Let's think about the real crux of the problem and, and ask the audience what they prefer. For example, in the US, for example, I'm a surgeon, okay? So we have 120,000 people waiting for transplants today at the moment in the US. Mm -hmm. One person every 14 minutes is put on that transplant list. 17,000 will have a transplant, effectively, and about 20% would die in the four years it takes that transplant to be affected. That's the problem. So all this 3D printing, 3D bioorganisms, etc., is related to a fundamental problem that we have. Mm -hmm. So I asked the audience when you asked the question, would you be prepared to wait four years for a transplant and die, 20% chance, or would you take a chance on single nephron being able to be imprinted, inserted? That's the kind of discussion we need to have from a humanity point of view, where 3D printing will help us and help the people out there say actually there's an alternative rather than existing model, which is donation. Yeah. The problem, the problem Dr. Shafi, is, is not just using the 3D printing for the purposes of uh, curing diseases. No, the people are wanted to have it for privileges, that, to enhance some capabilities that they, that they want to have it in extra limit of, um, uh, compared to the, to the, to the um, human norms, let's say. Um, this question goes to Raymond Sanchafi as well. Because of the um, uh, a human enhancement, it goes, is it because of the genome editing or it, it, it comes after, after a while when you have a person and you have the capability to be enhanced? And because of the 3D printing, we will be reaching that quite very soon. 
But the purpose maybe or the side effect is a, is, is a positive side effect of it is the longevity. Where, where, where do aging and older people fit in a future society with all of that and the 3D printing and enhancement of the capability of a normal human? Shafi and then Raymond. So longevity is obviously quite an uh, interesting term. It's very topical at the moment. A lot of money in Silicon Valley and other places going to thinking, how do we survive forever or for much longer? It's not about the longevity. It's not about the expanse of, of our lifetime. It's about the quality of life that matters. So if I ask you the question, would you prefer to live healthily and then die, or would you prefer to have chronic diseases going forward and dying slowly of Alzheimer's or other kind of conditions? And the answer would be, you'd rather have a good quality of life and then perhaps die at the end of it, having a good quality of life. So our kind of model has to be around wellness rather than treating the disease process or the sickness, and that's got to change. So longevity is one thing, but it's about the human dynamic, about being well enough in that period of time to, to manage your life effectively. Because that's, as humanity, we want to be well enough, we want to be able enough, we want to be mobile enough to have that quality of life which has been diminished. So I think that's the kind of dynamic that needs to be understood in the context of longevity. It's not about living forever, although some of us may want to live forever. Raymond? Yeah, whenever I look at this, I really see the, the possibility to not just extend life, but extend healthy life. And you kind of have to talk about your terms there. Some of the things that, you know, to whether you're fairly radical in this longevity and radical longevity extension or a little more fact-based and, you know, show me what has been done and what, where we're going. Uh, you kind of have to define your terms about what is healthy life and what is not. But the idea that we're squaring the longevity curve, more and more people are living into a ripe old age in their 80s, 90s, 100s, up to about 120. At the same time, we're working on this combination of 3D printing, advanced cell replacement and repair, gene editing, and I really think it's that kind of triumvirate that makes for these advanced technologies that will extend life for a lot of us here into a healthy old age and maybe even past that 120 barrier. And the short version is it's going to get really expensive and then I think really cheap. You know, we have our, our hope there. Um, but if you just look, we've been on this really incredible life extension story for over 100 years. Right now we're at adding about three months to average human lifespan roughly every year. And, you know, in the developed world, you look at about 85 being yeah. sort of that, that average place. The other thing is, demographically, I think you can make a really good case that the future in some ways belongs to the old. Just last year, we passed this milestone on Earth where there are now more people over 65 than there are under 16. First time in human history. The other thing I like to point out is for people who are working in this field and working in you know, different fields, that uh, the number of people on Earth that are over 65 now represent a global market that is a little bit bigger than China. Mm -hmm. John, you so want to elaborate on that? I think that, Raymond, you're, you're spot on with respect to that. It's about life extension and life expansion. Yep. But we look at, you know, aging is a terrible thing. Growing old is, a, is, is, is terrible. It, and we look at it as a problem. But I think that the, the opportunities around life extension and life expansion allow us to take our aging population, which, which is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, and making them more productive in the context of society. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're entering an era where we will see second and third careers, mm -hmm. where we will see someone who has the wisdom of 70 or 80 years applying that to a business or educational dynamic. And to me, that's fundamental. That's the game changer. And then let's take a look at that in the context of GDP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We look at our aging population as a burden, as expensive health costs with no contribution to society. 
And that, I think, is completely wrong, that we will be able to impact GDP and have a higher level of productivity from our citizenry across a gamut of ages. And just, just to kind of put an end to it, a girl born in, in, in the UK now has a one in three chance, a one in three chance of living to 100. 100. It's amazing. I'll come back to you, Anthony. Let's uh, hear from Philip, and then we'll, we'll hear from you. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh-huh. yes. Okay. All I can say is that if you want to live long, start now. Start when you're young, living healthy. Mm. And control your blood pressure, diabetes, all those things. Exercise, exercise your mind. Never stop exercising your mind if you want to, you know, stay alert. And I, I think that's the fundamental. Go ahead. Please, Anthony. Yes, absolutely. You know, of course, you know, when we talk about longevity, everybody, you know, wants to work on longevity and, uh, and wants to achieve longevity in terms of uh, science, right? Yeah. But the challenge is it's not just longevity. It's actually the quality of life that you have as you age. Because you can live longer, yep. but if you live longer and you start having major weaknesses, that's a challenge. So your body functionally has major changes that start occurring after age 40. That's right. So after age 40, your muscle mass starts decreasing, your collagen starts going away, your ability to rebound, the, the functionality of your... Of your uh, of your, va- of your blood vessel system. So I couldn't agree more with Philip. It's about actually starting early, having a very uh, healthy lifestyle. And w- longe- you cannot do longevity without actually looking at improvement of the quality of life. But I, I'm gonna, I want to push back on that a little bit because we're talking about technology and we're talking about 3D printing. So as we lose muscle mass, we can modulate myostatin. We can f- clinically suppress myostatin to build muscle. But the interesting thing for me is that the path to longevity is not wellness. It's not prevention in the traditional sense of the word because I think that what we're seeing is earlier and earlier and earlier technology-mediated disease detection. So if we can find cancer at the earliest point, at stage zero, Mm -hmm. that shares a border with prevention. And let's face it, the obese man, 65-year-old with metabolic syndrome, who wants to sit on his couch and watch the football game is very hard to motivate. But if we could leverage technology, whether it be in the form of stem cells for that collagen repair mechanism or organ replacement that are 3D printed, to me, I think the promise of longevity lies extraordinarily uh, close to technology because it shares a border with prevention. So I think that's a part of that dynamic. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is there are two things. You start young to stay healthy, then you can add on technology later on. Yeah, I I think that we we, we treat our bodies like cars. You know, if the car wears out, we, we coddle it and fix it, and we try to take care of the tire. No, take the tire off and replace it, we, and I think we'll see that. Yeah, we will talk about that, and, and, and um, um, of course, we, we have 10 minutes left, so I have two more questions, to be honest. Um, that's, it's, it's important to me to be, to be answered by, by you. Uh, now people are talking about the 3D printing at home. It, 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 they are saying they are very expensive, and I heard from you last night they are not expensive anymore. And Raymond explained to me why it is not expensive. So I will hear from you why it is not and what did you create not to make it that expensive. And can we reach into a level that we are making our pills and medicines at home from 3D printing or not? Raymond, please. Um, Yeah, to just kind of start on that, uh, my eyes were open to this a little bit whenever our our community lab, BioCurious, we had a, a group of people who were very interested in in bioprinting and and what could be done, and they got on the internet and priced a bioprinter at about a million U.S. dollars. And they said, that doesn't look that complicated. We think we could go ahead and at least come up with something, a little 2D bioprinter. And they took some inkjet cartridges and some little motors out of an old DVD player. And for under $200, they came up with something that would print in 2D little genetically modified bacterial cells. And they had it print out messages where the bacteria would change colors in the presence of heavy metals or lead or something and say, danger. And they could print this out on the bottom of a Petri dish. Um, They started trying to print vascular structures and things like this. Now, you know, granted, this $200 bioprinter was not a replacement for this million-dollar research tool, but it let people play in the field who wouldn't have had a chance otherwise. And so I think that that's what's happening. 
the price of all these things is coming down anyway, but the ability of people to come and tinker and experiment. And then the fact that more and more people are using these technologies in more workday ways, the scale effect for that means it's much cheaper to produce another one. It's no longer just a couple of strange little fringe companies. Why, 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 Shafi, you think that 3D printing or, to, or you have cheap 3D printing will help in the virtual uh, reality, the main focus work that you are doing? And virtual reality. We'd like to do some 3D virtual reality work, I guess. But I'd like to take that argument a bit further forward because it has become cheaper. The first machines were over. I've got a machine in my hospital which costs about £100,000 three years ago. Now that's become a museum piece, now hospital on the front desk, okay? Is it? Gathering dust. No one uses it, right? Yeah. Now they cost a few hundred pounds, so it's changing. But let's talk about the future, because this is really about thinking about the real um, kind of exponential medicines and technology. In about five or six years' time, we're going to be an interplanetary species. We go to Mars. Elon Musk thinks we're going to jump on a ship and go to Mars. So my concept around that is about what about the kind of things we're going to be doing in space and on Mars. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about if we do go to Mars, for example, how do we, in healthcare, create instruments, create pills? Mm -hmm. We can 3D print them. It's the only way. You can't transport them. It will take you so long that you can't actually treat anybody. And in fact, my friend, Julie Wong, who works on um, many space program, they sent the first 3D printer to the International Space Station last year. One of the astronauts damaged his finger because you tend to be a bit fumbling around, hit fingers. He broke his finger. She sent a PDF file to the ISS, mm -hmm. created a splint, he treated himself. She actually brought down for me a surgical instrument built in space on a 3D printer, which I used about three months ago. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of change. It's cheaper, more reliable, and now you can transport it into space and make it work. Right. Incredible, right? Okay. Do right. you want to elaborate, John, on that? What I find is that... About, about cheap... You remember the 3D movie... Printers? Um, um, the Gordon Gecko movie, Wall Street, the first cell phone. It was called The Brick. Mm -hmm. It was $10,000. We all wanted it, but it was very expensive. Remember five years ago or eight years ago, we saw this thing called the flat screen TV, and it was $10,000, and it was 38 inches, and we all wanted it. Today, it is becoming so, it's becoming demonetized the same way Genomic analysis used to be extraordinarily expensive. Now it's $1,000. I believe it will, it will become zero. So I think we will see demonetization of, of 3D printing. And also the interesting thing that Shafi talked about is printing at a distance. So if we talk about printing the, for, the, the proverbial organ, yeah. maybe I need to print that organ in Kenya. Or maybe I need to print it in New York City to facilitate organ transplant. So the ability to print in space, in your hospital, or around the world is very important. I think that cost will inevitably come very, very far down. Good. So in less than one minute, I will ask this a question, a general question, because I came from university, and I love universities, and I love the work they are doing, and centers, and, and everyone's kind is interconnected now, interdisciplinary work, that physicians are working with engineers, engineers working with technologists, technologists are working with economists, and everyone now is working together to come up with something. So my question is, how far are we from fully 3D printing body? I'm, I'm very optimistic. Uh, now we are uh, very difficult to come up with one organ, and the complicity with the liver that I'm working with, it's a huge um, um, uh, concern that we're concerned to just um, uh, tackle one issue or, so, or, or But how far we are? Is it, is it, is it tomorrow? Is it, is it 2020? or we will never reach it. So I will hear from Philip first, and then we'll go on. The brief answer is we're very, very far from it. Very, very, very far. Very pessimistic. So. So, uh, 20 years? <laughs> um, <laughs> 20 years from print a, Till you print the whole body? Yes. No. No. I doubt it. No, no, you don't think so. Anthony? Well, you know, I think if you, if you watch the, uh, one of the Avengers movies, of course, uh, you know, uh, one of the superheroes was entirely printed once they were injured. So. Of course, it's science fiction, but you never, you know, science uh, fiction can become science fact, so you never say never. But in reality, one of the I things... Did. Uh, no, no, you know, I did, yeah. yeah. I did. No, no, but you know, one of the... Exactly. I mean, the things you're doing, people probably said never, right, Crazy. Philip? So I think one of the main things here is we have to, you know, put it in perspective. 
uh, you know, we have been able to implant engineered tissues into patients, right? So there are patients walking around right now with engineered tissues and organs. It took decades to get to that, right? It took several decades to get there. The reality is that not a single organ has yet been implanted into a patient that has been, that's been printed. We've implanted organs into patients that have been created by hand. And that took, you know, several decades to actually create tissues and organs that we were able to implant back into patients. And we do that by using the patient's own cells. We take a cell, we create the tissue, we put it back into the patient. So printing, really, the way that printing became open into this field was really as a scale-up tool. It's really a scale-up tool. You have to realize what all the cell biology is, the biochemistry, the cell biology, the physiology, the material sciences to create these tissues that you can put into patients. Mm -hmm. And the printing is really just a scale-up tool. You have to understand the biology because when you talk about any tissue in the body, they're extremely complex. So I think that, yes, it is possible to engineer tissues and organs. It has already been done. We've been able to implant these into patients. We're now using printing as a scale-up tool to put these patients, these organs back into patients. I think the future will be how do you actually start to increase that and to actually bring the printer to the bedside, and that's actually occurring too. But I think it's going to be a long time coming before we can print an entire body. But you never say never. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. John? Today. Today, as we speak? Yes. Why? Well, one well, organ system think? is the skeletal system, right? We're, we're developing 3D printed implants for bone, for fibroblast deposition. So we're using that now clinically. So I would argue that we are beginning to implant organs that are created with respect to bone and the skeletal system. Yeah, so but I, John, he said the whole body. And you, well, can, you can't just, like, make a few bones <laughs> and, I'm not finished. and put them together. It's not building so I think far. the trajectory is established. I think that it's going to happen, number one. And number two, to, to, get to your slide and Ray Kurzweil, we live in a time of exponential change. And with right. the addition of... AI, mm -hmm. with robotics, with, with advanced techniques, I, I see that we are 15 years out to really doing significantly th interesting endeavors that create a transhuman reality. Yeah, so I think it's closer than you think. Right, but the AI people will have a robot for AI that you know, surpasses us, so we won't be needed. So you won't be need to. Well, true. Is AI man's last great invention? Is I would ask you. It very well may be. Say it again. Is AI man's last great invention? After that which we won't have to invent anymore. Well, it'll never stop inventing itself, and the computers will never stop improving themselves at their own pace and at their own volition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I would have to say one, one important thing. Uh, devices have been implanted into patients right now to replace bones. So you know how you make a piece of metal and you can, you're actually printing that piece of metal or printing, but really no, there has not been an actual bone implant into a patient at this point. There has been no printed viable tissue that has been placed in a patient. It's not to say that it can be done because some of these structures are being created by hand and placed into patients, so I think printing will definitely get there. Uh, but I think that in, in reality, it's going to be a little while before, uh, before you have printed organs, uh, you know, a large number of printed organs in patients. It's going to be very, very complex. The body's extremely complex. It is. So, of course, I think it's doable, but I don't think, you know, I don't, you never say never. I think it's doable, but I think it's going to be a little while. So, in less than 30 seconds, um, Shafi and Raymond, can you answer this question, please, quick? We need to close this session. Just very quickly, I'll take a different point. Yes, at some point we'll be able to rebuild a human and do the organs, but actually it's not about that, it's about humanity. What about the soul? What about our consciousness levels? What about who we are? So we may replace a human, but can we really? It's about the other bits that we come with that may not be able to build on a kind of biological scaffold. So that's the kind of thing we've got to think about in the future. That's right. That's right. Raymond? Two points, before we see that 3D printed body, and I think we'll get there, we're going to see in the next five years 3D printed organoids externally, and we'll use that to do personalized testing and really to replace 
some animal testing and a lot of human testing for clinical trials, and that will revolutionize and speed the progress of medicine. That will be the first great piece from this. But to really answer your question, 25 years we'll be able to effectively go neck down and replace all or most of everything. I like that, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will be there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, very nice discussion. We have lots of questions and we have lots of concerns about the 3D and 3D bioprinting. The time is not, is not it's always not enough for uh, such a nice and interesting topic. And thank you, audience, for coming and interesting about the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. جلسه رائعه بكل تاكيد يوما ما سنرى هنا في الامارات دكتور النخبي زراعه الاعضاء البشريه ثلاثيه الابعاد ثانك يو طبعا بما ان احنا في قمه المعرفه واكيد هناك اطلاقات كثيره مبادرات كثيره ورش عمل ايضا كثيره ملهمه تساهم في صنع المحتوى القيم يس yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the summit this year will witness announcing the names of the knowledge ambassadors for the first time, where selected influencers are appointed to convey the message of knowledge around the world. نعم. اليوم يتم إطلاق مبادرة سفراء المعرفة لأول مرة من منصة القمة في عامها الرابع، وهي معنية بتعيين مؤثرين يحملون رسالة المعرفة معهم حول العالم. We now invite His Excellency Jamal bin Huwairab, the CEO of MBRF, and Michael O'Neill, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, to hand certificates to the knowledge ambassadors. ندعو إلى المنصة سعادة جمال بن حويرب المديرة التنفيذي لمؤسسة محمد بن راشد المكتوم للمعرفة ومايكل أونيل الأمين العام المساعد للأمم المتحدة لتسليم شهادات لهؤلاء السفراء اللي سيسلمون شهادات للمعرفة تقديرا لجهودهم ودورهم في نشر المعرفة نبدأ بالسفير الأول جيسون سيلفا مذيع تلفزيوني وفنان متخصص في ألعاب العقل The first recipient will be knowledge ambassador Jason Silva futurist and the media artist and the TV personality. Knowledge Ambassador Muna Abu Suleiman. الدكتور خبير راشد حمدان الغافري رئيس قسم البيولوجيا والحمض النووي بالإدارة العامة للأدلة الجنائية وعلم الجريمة هو سفيرنا الثالث للمعرفة. Our third ambassador will be the knowledge ambassador, expert Captain Rashid Hamdan Al Ghafri. He heads the DNA and biology section in the Department of Forensic Sciences and Criminology at Dubai Police. المعرفة الذي تستمتعنا بالأمس في إحدى جلسات اليوم الأول تنمي باكشي مطور برمجيات وكاتب ومحاضر Our next ambassador is Tanmay Bakshi for artificial intelligence الروبوت صوفيا من شركة هانسن روبوتكس هي السفيرة المعرفة الأخيرة في الدفعة الأولى من السفراء المعرفة التي 
يتم اطلاق هذه المبادره هذا العام صوفيا and our final ambassador is Sophia the robot from Hansen Robotics Sophia has something to say She has something to say, Sophia, for the audience. I am very honored to become the first robot ambassador of the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation. Let's start the future today. Whoa. Thank you, Sophia. Let's start the future today. Thank you. Can we have a, a group photo, please? <laughs>